Ready, George? Yep. All right. Ready, guys? Yeah. All right. One, two, three, go. Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're here to sing of God's great love today. to the well of life, the water that brings us life. And we pray that you would meet with us this morning, that you would speak to us through your word, that the fellowship would be rich through the Holy Spirit, that we would be open to whatever you have for us this morning. Let's sing together.
Amen and amen. Why don't you have a seat? Thank you. Good morning. Well, my name is Annie Giordano, and I am the College and Young Adults Ministry Coordinator here. Um, I'm going to be leading us in a responsive reading that we've been using every fall, just to remind ourselves of some important truths about why we gather. So if you can turn over your song sheet to the back, I'll read the questions, and then you can respond with the answers. What are we doing here today? Why not do this at home by ourselves? How shall we worship together? How does what we do here together relate to the rest of our lives? Awesome. Well, these are important things to continue to consider as we meet together week by week. Before we go any further, we have a few announcements to make you aware of what's happening around here. I want to give a special welcome to Westmont students. Um, congrats on surviving your first week back at school. <laughs> Um, while life on campus, I know, can be busy in and of itself, um, I would love to connect with you after service, either at the check-in table or if you see me around, um, just to let you know of events that we have coming up, and also to hear how we can support you as a church community. Um, I'm now going to pass the mic over to Ken. Thank you, Annie. Everybody give a hand for Annie, please. <laughs> If you have not had the pleasure of meeting Annie and her husband, Frank, they are some of my favorite folks here. So definitely go and talk to them, introduce yourselves. And they're really cool. They make pottery. That's all you have to know. They're super cool. And so definitely come and get to know them and speak with them as well, too. Just some announcements of what's going on here today as we continue our worship. Our 40 days of prayer have begun. So it started on September 1st and is continuing on to October 10th. And we're committing this season to really drawing closer to our God, asking him to speak to us us, to use us for his purposes in the world. If you are not, if you're not able to, uh, you haven't received the daily prompts yet by email, you can actually pick up a hard copy over there at the welcome table so you can receive that as well, kind of journeying through the season in prayer with us. And along with this, we encourage you to join with us every Wednesday in the morning from 6.45 to 7.45 in the fellowship hall over there for a powerful time of prayer that's led by our brother, Ben Patterson. And so join us for that. Definitely you want to kind of continue to walk with us in that. Uh, if we're starting our fall study of the amazing book of Isaiah too, so make sure to pick up a study guide over there. Aaron, I believe, is there, and so my office mate, and so definitely go and pick up a study guide if you haven't already. And the book of Isaiah that we're going to be entering into soon, it's an amazing book. It's not the easiest book, and so we want to kind of provide some help and some teaching on that too. So our dear sister, Sandy Richter, she'll actually be giving us kind of a running head start in that by leading a seminar this weekend. It's going to be this Friday from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., and on Saturday from 9 to 12 in the morning. And so it's going to also be in the fellowship hall in the back as well. Um, Sandy Richter's phenomenal, an amazing scholar, amazing teacher. So you do not want to miss this. I'll be there. You guys should be there too. 
And lastly, and most importantly, maybe not most importantly, but very importantly, from September 15th to the 18th, we're going to have the Santa Barbara Sending Conference, the Mission Conference, and it's taking place at Westmont College. And so there's an amazing lineup of global partners, of missionaries, of amazing folks coming in to teach us about having a heart of missions and really engaging in God's work around the world, too. Uh, you can sign up online, or you can actually jump over there, too. Our brother Charlie is over there, so you can definitely definitely go and sign up and receive more information about this conference. Do not miss this conference. Just looking at the lineup and things, it is a phenomenal conference. And a lot of times you'll get maybe one or two of the speakers that they have lined up. They have so many. And so really the quality of this conference is going to be phenomenal. So we want to encourage you to sign up for that as well. I'm not going to shift a little bit. I'm going to, I get to do something very, very special here. I'm going to invite uh, Noah Karp from the organization Horizons International to come on up and to join me on the stage. We're wrapping up our special offering for the poor that's going on through World Relief's work in Sudan. Previously, in one of our special offerings for the poor, we actually gave to an organization called Horizons International. And uh, we did this because we wanted to respond. Many of you might remember last summer in August in 2020, there was the explosion that took place in Lebanon. And so we gave a portion of our special offering for the poor to engage in that work and the relief work there. So it's not a a lot of times we give these offerings and we kind of, of course, say, God, use our offering, use us to, to really be used for your kingdom work. It's not very often that we actually get to hear and kind of close the loop in terms of what our offering accomplished and how God used it. So here we have, I'm so happy to have Noah Carp. He's a really cool guy, too. We've been just becoming fast friends here as well. And he's the director of communications of Horizons International. So he's here today. Uh, Noah, can you just introduce yourself and just kind of tell us more about Horizons International, bro? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. <laughs> nice to meet y'all. Um, uh, yeah, so I've uh, been working for Horizons International in communications for four years now. Um, I work in Boulder, Colorado. That's where our U.S. base of operations is. And um, Horizons International is essentially a, a, a ministry organization that uh, we are focused on proclaiming the gospel, discipling the nations, and equipping the church. And what that means in practical terms is that we're always focused on bold and radical evangelism, sharing the word before anything else, and then also discipling people. We want to raise up leaders in uh, indigenous countries like uh, Lebanon, for example, where your, your guys' gift went. And, um, and so then um, lastly, and probably most importantly, is we believe in partnering with the local church to make sure that... Uh, that they have the, the sending capacity and the resources and any training, whatever they need in order to fully reach their communities. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about us. And uh, we're very active in Lebanon. Um, that's where our, our international base of operations is. So when the disaster hit, we were sort of very well placed infrastructurally to sort of jump right into helping after that. Last year, as we talked about, we gave uh, a portion of our special offering to the poor, to Horizons, for the work being done after the explosion. Can you just share how our offering was used and uh, what it accomplished, and uh, really, too, like how are things going in Lebanon even now? Yeah. Well, so after the blast, obviously, immediately, 300,000 people were left homeless, and the infrastructure and healthcare and all that kind of stuff was immediately disrupted in Beirut. So um, a lot of our uh, first work and a lot of where Santa Barbara's uh, funds went were towards um, getting out meals to people, handing out free meals, equipping churches to make sandwiches and chicken dinners and all sorts of things that they could pass out to people on the streets and to their congregations. And um, uh, also we did a lot of medical work trying to secure people's prescriptions that were disrupted and stuff like that. So. And then lastly, we also sent out construction teams into people's houses to repair doors, windows, replace appliances, all kind of things that had been damaged by the blast. So um, at the time that that gift was given, that's where um, a lot of the funds went because um, we were dealing with such like a short-term crisis response. Um, and then um, even now, um, like the work that's happened, like we've seen a historic influx of people into Lebanese churches. Um, out of the 103 evangelical churches in Lebanon, we've partnered with 85 of them to distribute aid and to sort of just take in like this massive number of people that are needing hope and needing uh, support in this time. So 
Um, I just wanted to share with you, um, because of the Lebanon Crisis Fund and our ability to reach out into Lebanon, so far in the last year we've seen 2,600 professions of faith, 1,300 people in discipleship relationships, um, and we passed out 300,000 free meals, um, repaired 700 doors and windows in churches and homes. So it's just been um, such a joy to be able to minister in this way and to be prepared in this way for such a disaster. And, you know, the impact of uh, uh, the gift that you guys made um, is not only so powerful, even just in, in, in what it is, but in Lebanon right now, the currency has devalued something like 20 times. So the, the U.S. dollars that we're able to spend there go much, much farther than they've ever been able to go before. And we're able to get more food, we're able to hire people. We hired on 40 new interns from Lebanese churches to work in coding, tech, design, and sort of allow them to build up their churches in new ways. So it's been um, really amazing to see. And, and I will say that the, the situation in Lebanon now is actually worse than it was after the blast. Um, it's not something you hear about very often because there's always something else in the news. But um, aside from the currency devaluation, Right now they're dealing with gas shortages. We've had like six to 20 hours of waiting in line for gas stations and also same with power outages, six to 24 hours a day without power. Um, and then so people are just sort of struggling and, and in that we've been really honored to lift up the local church as sort of a bastion of comfort and relief and light. So we've seen a lot of people responding to that and yeah, flocking to the partner churches. Um, kind of a last question. How can we continue to pray for you, the work that Horizons International is doing, especially in Lebanon? Well, thanks, Ken. I think that uh, probably the biggest thing that we're dealing with right now is that, as I said before, we were initially focused on short-term crisis response and sort of dealing with like the massive number of people whose lives immediately had changed. But Right now, Lebanon is in one of the worst global crises in the last 150 years, and it's looking like it's going to take years um, to get out of this, to sort of find a path to recovery. So um, I think where Horizons is trying to move toward is from short-term crisis response to long-term development, where we um, not only are hiring interns and trying to strengthen the local churches, but we also actually just bought our first piece of farmland in the Bekaa Valley, which we're going to use to hire local believers and form a ministry center, missional community, and then hire refugees to work and to sort of like give them a way to support their families. And then on top of that, be able to distribute the food there to, to local churches in order to distribute to people that need it. So um, I think really, our biggest prayer is that um, the local church would be lifted up because right now, as I said, they're dealing with a huge influx of new believers. And it's one of those things that like, when you have your church population double or something, all of a sudden you have to more counseling and more discipleship and sort of more resources and all the things that like, um, that come along with explosive growth. So we're really praying that we can support the church there as much as possible to to steward what they've been given and to grow and to unite across the nation in order to better serve. So that's really our prayer. Thank you, brother. You can return. You're done, brother. You can go and relax and see. Let's definitely give him some love here. An amazing brother. He'll be here for after service. He'll be here for the next service as well, too. So definitely get to talk to, to Noah and just learn more and more about the amazing work that is taking place there and how we can get more and more engaged in that work, too. I also want to share with you just a few things about how our church is sought to be locally and globally engaged in God's work to be a blessing to the nations. Uh, recently, we were able to give a gift uh, of $10,000 to an organization called Mission to the World in response to the COVID response uh, relief in India. And so we're able to give in that way. We also were able to give a financial gift through Converge, their global, global partners in Thailand to provide emergency COVID relief too. And uh, many of us, we've also been able to, we've known and seen just what's been taking place recently in Haiti and as well in Afghanistan. And so the missions committee and I, we've been working a lot and, and meeting a lot and having many discussions. And so we've actually made a decision. We've given two 
two separate gifts through World Relief of $10,000 in each place in terms of their, the relief work that's taking place there as well, too. So we just want to always say thank you so much for your generous offering. Thank you for just being involved in this because uh, we want to be a church that really seeks to be a blessing. Uh, we're not a church that seeks to elevate a particular person or committee or, or even just the name of our church, but we desire to exalt God. What Benji spoke last week really just struck a chord in me. There is no celebrity here except for Jesus. That, that's who we elevate and who we're focused upon here. And so I pray this is always the case, but as folks who are so faithful in your generous giving, I want to share this with you as we continue to be engaged in this work together of reaching the nations, making disciples of all people, and the work is great, but of course our God is greater. And so with that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We thank you, Father, that you have gathered us together today to worship you, to be used by you for your glory. We thank you that you have placed this treasure of Christ in us, us as frail and broken jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from you and not from us. So, Lord, we offer you our lives so that, Lord, have your way with us. Lord, we lift up Horizons International and the important work that they're doing to fulfill your great commission, preaching the gospel, reaching the lost, grant them vision, grant them focus as they continue to reach out to more and more people, especially in the Lebanon region. We thank you for the ways that you are moving in that region with more and more people spiritually hungry and coming to the church. We pray that you would equip and strengthen local churches there to receive and disciple these people well. We pray that as the harvest is abundant, the workers are few, that you would continue to build up Horizons International with more and more workers who would have a deep passion and vision to engage in this work. And we pray that more churches there in that region and here in the United States too would come together for the work and the ministry in that region, the region of Lebanon. God, we also lift up our brothers, Tim Kuros and Kevin Calloway as they're in Liberia right now. We thank you for granting them a safe travel, protecting them, using them. Thank you for the opportunities that you have been giving to them to provide teacher training, leadership training. As about 200 students have passed their entrance exam and are signed up for the start of the school, we pray that you would provide a principal with great experience and leadership. Lord, continue to strengthen and use Tim and Kevin and the rest of their time there, especially together in their time with Say and Yap Yor. Lord, we pray for your compassion and comfort for those who are going through trouble, who are going through difficulty. We pray for all those affected by Hurricane Ida. Pray for those suffering and being affected by the Caldor fire. And would you lead us in ways that we as a church, as the people of God, that we can get involved. Lord, we also pray for our church community. Please be with Cindy Hadidian, Jack Dawson, as they continue to live with cancer. Lord, would you continue to provide care and hope for the Hardman family as they continue to grieve the loss of their son-in-law Cameron. Lord, we entrust them to your care. We ask that you would reveal yourself strong and near to them and love them, O oh God, with your perfect love. Father, we're always so thankful for Mike and Benji as our lead pastors. Bless them and their families. Lord, especially be with Benji today as he teaches us from your word. We believe that your word is truly a, a living, that it, your word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. So God, give us, our, give us hearts today, a fertile soil ready to receive your word so that we may be sent out into your harvest. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give a, some love to Benji as well. <laughs> I had to do it, brother. I know. Oh, I, know. I mean, you're uh, new, but we don't do that, man. Come on, man. <laughs> there are certain things we brought you here to address and change. That's not one of them. Oh, my goodness. Well, again, welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. Whether you're joining us here in person on the patio or from home online, it is just a privilege to be together week by week and to be the church. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, would you open it to Acts chapter 2? We are going to be wrapping up today our brief three-week study of Acts chapter 2. Next week, we're going to start our time in Isaiah. I'm really looking forward to that. But before we jump into that, we've been talking for these last few weeks about what it means to be church together, drawing on the example of the earliest church in Acts chapter 2. Mike started us off by looking at what it means to be disciples together. Last week, we talked about what it means to be invested together. And today we're going to return 
to Acts 2 and consider a final element of our being church together. And with today's teaching, we, we reach really a necessary rounding out of the picture of church together. We reach a critical aspect of church life that if we lack it, well, we run the risk of sounding like little kids on a bus in Greenbow, Alabama. Forrest Gump lived a life full of accidental adventure, you might remember, but long before he invested in Apple stock, before he ran across America, before he broke the Watergate scandal, before he met Bubba and Lieutenant Dan in Vietnam, before he played football for Bear Bryant's Crimson Tide, before he drank all the Dr. Pepper at the White House, he was just a little kid in Greenbow, Alabama, trying to get to the first day of school. You might remember, remember little Forrest walking down the center aisle of the bus, very hopefully making eye contact with kid after kid, only to hear seats taken, can't sit here. And poor Forrest, you just empathize for him. But these kids had decided they had all the community they needed. They had all the people they were looking for. They were simply unwilling to make room for Forrest to join them. And sadly, it is possible for churches to act similarly. And it could be especially tempting for churches with a rich life together to fall prey to that kind of an attitude. But as we return to Acts 2, we see that there was no such attitude in the earliest church. Are you in Acts 2? Hopefully. If you're new to the Bible, it's the fifth book in your New Testament. It comes after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we are going to return to the same text that we've considered for each of the last two weeks, beginning in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. So if you are able, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's word? Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, we read this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, Thanks be to God indeed. You may have a seat. Well, after considering being disciples together and invested together, today I want to help us think about what it means to be on mission together. And I want to look more closely at three phrases from what we just read that will help us with that. And the first is this phrase, enjoying the favor of all the people. The term favor here is a form of the Greek word charis, which is most often translated in your New Testament as the word grace. Could also be translated as goodwill. This community of believers enjoyed goodwill not only amongst themselves, which we would probably expect based on what we've already read, but also, the text reminds us, with all the people. And you need to know, it's okay if this surprises you. Think about the story of this group of believers. This community has been gathered by common belief in the kingship of a man who just weeks earlier had been executed as a criminal by the governing authorities. And the emphasis in the early verses in this section that we just read, well, it's really focused on the nature of their internal fellowship. It said nothing about their attitude and their posture toward those outside of their community. And it would have been understandable, given their particular origin story, for this little band of believers to huddle themselves away in a cloister of their own making, cut off from those who might threaten this fledgling community and just focus on being together around the scriptures and in prayer and breaking bread, sharing their belongings and living a rich internal life together. And instead we read of them enjoying the favor of all the people. This is remarkable. Scholar Paul Mumo Kisau of Scott Christian University in Kenya, he writes this, there is no indication that the apostles encouraged the forming of an exclusive community. 
Peter's advice to the people to save themselves from this corrupt generation in verse 40 does not imply a need to form a community away from the world. What we have here is a new community of believers where all the believers were together and yet remained within the wider society. Rather than shelter in place, the church is called to shine forth. Rather than burrow away, the church is called to bear witness. Jesus himself said as much when he told his disciples, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to talk real quickly about two practical implications that come out of understanding that the church in Acts 2 was enjoying the favor of all the people. And the first is this. We can't be on mission together if we're only ever together. It is a really good thing to have deep relationships and a wide network of friends from among your Christian brothers and sisters. But we have to remember that holy huddles don't often enjoy the favor of all the people. If you don't know anyone outside of the family of God, your light isn't shining where it could be. The second implication that comes out of this is that it actually matters how we live when we're not together. You can't act like a jerk all week and then wonder why your neighbor or your coworker or your classmate doesn't want to worship beside you. If we hope to enjoy the favor of all the people, we have to examine how we live when we are among all the people. So the text tells us that the church enjoyed the favor of all the people. I want to look at a second phrase, also in verse 47. The Lord added to their number daily. The church in Acts is on a very impressive growth trajectory. You might remember at the end of Peter's sermon in Acts 2, verse 41, we read that about 3,000 were added to their number. And here we see that the church continued to grow daily. If the church was a tech startup, this is the time for the IPO because things are going so well. Now, I find it fascinating that there's no missionaries mentioned in this passage. The term evangelist isn't used in this passage either, which might leave many of us perplexed if your paradigm of how people learn about Jesus is similar to how mine was when I was a kid. Growing up in church, I always thought that missions was something for oddly dressed folks who would come around every couple years with weird artifacts to show the youth group. Come on, you know it's true. You can laugh. And that somehow, here's, here's the other thing I thought, somehow, despite the weird clothes and the willingness to travel with blow darts and other things like that, these must have been super spiritual, uber flawless Christians, the kind of people that other people automatically listen to because I had concluded, after all, they were missionaries and missionaries is how people hear about Jesus. But then I got to know some missionaries and discovered that, not surprisingly, what I thought when I was a child was not accurate. Rather than super advanced, sinless language ninjas who were really comfortable living in tropical settings, the people I met were women and men whose passion was simply to use their ordinary lives in the extraordinary adventure of life on mission wherever that took them. Which I hope we would each find both comforting and a little bit convicting. We need to see that there's a direct link between these two phrases in verse 47. Our Bibles separate them by punctuation, but they really function together. We learn that the church was enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily. And I think this helps us reframe the concept of what it means to be on mission. The mission force that the Lord used so mightily in this passage was a group of ordinary believers who enjoyed the favor of all the people. Every single person who belongs to the family of God by faith in Jesus is called into the adventure of mission. Some will be called into that adventure overseas. 
Most will be called into that adventure in places that don't require a passport and a visa. And yet every single believer in Jesus is caught up into his command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Every single believer in Jesus is caught up in his promise that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that means that each of us is called to live on mission wherever God has called us and placed us. Now, you may already know that the term translated as nations in Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations is best understood as a reference to people groups, not land masses on a map defined by geopolitical borders. Each of us has been placed in the midst of various people groups that are longing to know of the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ your beach volleyball squad, your hiking friends, your CrossFit crowd, people groups, your pep group, your coworker lunch bunch, your fellow club lacrosse parents, people groups, political refugees, undocumented immigrants, international students, all just trying to make America their new home, people groups. The other residents of Samarkand or married student housing or Armington, people groups. I could go on and on, but you get the picture. As Peyton Jones writes in his book, Reaching the Unreached, being a missionary isn't so much a matter of geography as a matter of posture. We have the privilege of having sent out people to nations around the globe, and I hope we see lots more of that in the years ahead. And I also hope that we see more of people understanding their calling to live on mission among the people that already surround us as we go through our day-to-day lives. We long to be a church that is inviting young and old to the truly good life in Jesus and in the family of God. We long to see that happen among the nations, whether those nations are far away or nearby. And it's important to recognize that the subject of the verb in this phrase is the Lord. It's the Lord was adding to their number daily. It is the Lord who adds to the church's number. And in his grace and the wonder of his kingdom, he has chosen to use the people of the church on mission to the nations around them to bring that miracle to pass. So there's one last phrase I want us to look at from verse 47. And since there's not much left in the verse, you probably already know what it is. It's the phrase, those who were being saved. And this small phrase, highlights the urgency of the task of mission. Because people being brought into the family of God by faith in Christ is more than just a nice benefit to themselves. It is a matter of being saved. When I was young, we had neighbors who um, lived around the corner from us, the Mitchell family, and they had a swimming pool and we'd love to go over there and swim. But I remember being over there one day when I was not there to swim. And um, I honestly don't remember what happened, um, but I somehow found myself in their pool at the bottom in my jeans and my Pink Panther t-shirt. I remember it very clearly. It's very strange. I I can tell you exactly what I was wearing. And I remember being at the bottom, and though I know how to swim, swimming in jeans and a Pink Panther t-shirt is not easy. And I remember struggling for just a moment and thinking, "I'm, I'm I'm in danger here at the deep end of the pool not meaning to be here. And all of a sudden, the, um, the older sister of my friend, she jumped in and she grabbed me and she helped pull me up. And I, to this day, I don't know how I got there. I don't remember what happened. I don't remember if I got pushed. I just knew that all of a sudden I was in a situation where I had no ability to rescue myself. And she did. And I am so glad that she didn't just look and think, huh, it seems like he's in trouble, needs something something I might be able to do something about, but then I would have to get wet. No, she thought he needs help and I can do something about that. Friends, the task of mission is equally urgent because the scriptures are clear that our fundamental problem in life is that we need to be saved. Our sin separates us from the holy God who made us in love for relationship with him. And this gulf between humans and God that is created by sin 
It cannot be crossed by human effort, by positive thinking or generally good living. And the price of that sin is eternal separation from God's perfection and holiness and joy. And like young me at the bottom of the pool, we are in need of rescue. And this language I know might seem a little outdated or even offensive, but we don't do anybody any favors if we water this down. Those apart from Christ are in need of saving. So hear the good news. Christianity is a rescue religion. Every other religious system in the world will give you a way to improve yourself in hopes of either rising above the difficulties of the world or perhaps pleasing often fickle deities who hold the keys to paradise in a very arbitrary manner. Christianity alone claims that the all-powerful creator God entered into the brokenness of the world and faced down the difficulties of life in order to do for his beloved image bearers what they could not do for themselves and no amount of self-improvement could ever do to save them from their sin and set them free to live a life that is shaped by grace rather than by karma or by law or by hopelessness. And this truest of stories is why the church exists. The church exists both by mission, as a result of God's missionary heart that showed his love through faithful pursuit of his wayward people, and for mission, the spread of the good news among people who long for the truly good life and are prone to look in all the wrong places. A church that isn't on mission ceases to be the church in any meaningful sense. It would be like a giraffe without a long neck or a fish without gills or a bird without wings or a cat that shows interest in humans. We need to get this. God doesn't have a mission for his church in the world. He has a church for his mission in the world. And this sense of urgency and identity is what catapults ordinary Christians into the extraordinary adventure of living on mission. It leads people like Noah to dedicate his life to seeing the people of Lebanon find hope and come to faith in Christ. It leads our friend Rolf Geiling to pour himself into making the Santa Barbara Rescue Mission a place of shelter and restoration where people are treated with the dignity befitting God's image bearers. It leads our friends Merrill and Teresa to spend their lives among a tribal people that now has the scriptures in their heart language and who we can now call our brothers and sisters in Christ. It leads our friends Reuben and Holly Gill to look at their own neighborhood and reimagine it and their way of life in it in light of the kingdom of God. It leads many of us to sign up for Santa Barbara Sending next week to learn more about how God has already shaped and called us into the adventure of mission. This is just the tip of the iceberg about what God has graciously allowed us to be involved in. I could talk for hours about how the church on mission plays out through Christ-centered microfinance in Zambia or through Bible translation in Papua New Guinea, or through a dedicated team that serves the homeless in Isla Vista each month, or through those taking the good news to students from junior high through college throughout the Santa Barbara area, or through the person in the workplace or school who lives and speaks as one aware of the privilege and calling of life on mission. We long to bring the whole gospel to the whole city, and each of us has to play a part. If we believe that mission is something left to others, some optional aspect of the Christian life for someone else to do, there will be entire people groups, neighborhoods, aspects of our society that do not benefit from the witness and the work of the church. Yet if we recognize that in Christ, we are on mission together, no matter where God has placed us and no matter where he is calling us next, we can begin to live the adventure that we've been called into. Now, I've said a lot here, so I want to give us a few moments in silence to consider. What is the Spirit stirring in response to what you've heard here? Maybe it's first-time commitment to the saving love of Christ, or maybe it's a fresh commitment to living a life on mission, or maybe it's something very personal that the Spirit has for you alone. 
But in the silence, for just a few moments, I dare you to ask, I dare you to listen, to pay attention, and to move courageously in response to what you hear. So let's take a few moments in silence to reflect on what we've considered here. Well, one last time, I want you to hear this passage that we've considered these past few weeks. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Leslie Newbegin was a 20th century missionary to India who was startled when he returned to his homeland of England to find that his homeland was just as much a mission field as the one that he had spent his life to evangelize. And I want to read you a quote from Leslie Newbegin. It casts a hopeful vision for the potential of a church on mission. It's a lengthy quote, but it's worth it. So I invite you to dig in for just a moment. He writes this, If the gospel is to challenge the public life of our society, if Christians are to occupy the high ground, which they vacated in the noontime of modernity, it will not be by forming a Christian political party or by aggressive propaganda campaigns. Once again, it has to be said that there can be no going back to the Constantinian era. It will only be by movements that begin with the local congregation in which the reality of the new creation is present, known, and experienced, and from which men and women will go into every sector of public life to claim it for Christ to unmask the illusions which have remained hidden and to expose all areas of public life to the illumination of the gospel. But that will only happen as and when local congregations renounce an introverted concern for their own life and recognize that they exist for the sake of those who are not members as sign, instrument, and foretaste of God's redeeming grace for the whole of life of society. Well, God's redeeming grace, of which Newbegin spoke, is most clearly seen on the cross of Christ. If you have your communion elements, I invite you to take them. The Apostle Paul, in speaking of what this meal means, he writes to the believers in Rome the following things. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Later in that same letter, he says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And then in a part of Romans 10 that we don't often consider, he follows that up with this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, we have good news. And so when we approach this meal, we come with both gratitude and resolve. We receive it with thankfulness and joy and with hearts ready to be stirred and shaped by it anew. When we consider the lengths that our missionary God went to so that we could be added to the number of those who are saved. We take bread and we remember that on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. We're going to continue in our worship in just a moment. I want to let you know there'll be a prayer team to my left, to your right. They would love to pray with you about anything at all, whatever it might be that the Spirit the Spirit is stirring in your heart, anything you might be considering as a result of what you've heard, a burden you brought with you, whatever it might be, we long to be a family that is bearing one another's burdens, and our prayer team would love to do that alongside of you. But I want to encourage you to stand as we continue in our worship. Amen. What a good word. Well, let's respond in song.
Amen. Well, we have uh, talked about great news today, that we have a God who saves, that he calls us alongside him to be his witnesses. Uh, but if any of you are feeling like me, that that's, that's a weighty thing to be messengers of a holy God. Um, there's good news for that too, that God gives us his Holy Spirit and enables us to be of use to him. So we're going to uh, take this last song to devote ourselves again to God's uh, providential care for us and that he would fill us and use us for his glory. So this is a, a hymn that you're probably familiar with, but the chorus we haven't sung for a little while. So let me sing it for you and we'll... Uh, learn it once again. It goes like this. So take my life, let it be everything, all of me. Here I am, use me for your glory. In everything I say and do, let my life honor you. Here I am, living for your glory. Take, try that with me. So take my life, let it be
Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you as you go today. May the Lord, the great God who we've worshiped today, turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. May that God turn his smiling face towards you and give you peace as you seek to take the gospel wherever you go this week. Amen. 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 Have a great week. Good to see you all.